Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is uh, the Romans Education Part 7, and this is Session 12. Uh, we were talking about our Heavenly Father has a certain attitude toward the ungodliness of this world, and that's the attitude that really needs to be developed in us. But He also has an attitude toward the works of darkness that are performed in this world, and that attitude is going to have to be duplicated in us as well. <clears throat> what God sees, Satan's works of darkness. When it talks about casting off the works of darkness, look, I want you to understand that that's talking about something that Satan is doing in the world. So, what God sees as the works of darkness is literally the engine that is powering powering the world's ungodliness. It's what's driving the world's ungodliness. And it, and it causes the ungodliness of the world to increase more and more. That This is part of what Satan is doing with his policies of evil and especially with his works of darkness. And, and they're, they're, they're what makes the world into the world of the ungodly. And once we get His attitude developed in us, we'll see those works of darkness for what they are, the way that our Heavenly Father sees it. And that's, once we see it for what it is, that's what motivates us to cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And, but we're going to have to see it the way He does in order for that, for that to happen. Okay, and, and by the way, why, why do we need to see it? like he sees it? Why, why, why do we need to be as disgusted with Satan's works of darkness as our father is? I mean, there's got to, I mean, what, what is he trying to accomplish in that? Because if we don't see it for what it is, or see it the way he sees it, those things will not, we won't be repulsed by those things the way he is. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that at some moderation differently. We're not thinking like yeah, we're not thinking like he is. That's exactly right. So, it, 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 and just to end this up, even, even though God has restrained his wrath for now, he, he hasn't overlooked those things. He doesn't feel better about it. He hasn't changed his mind. But he will unleash that wrath once this dispensation of grace has come to an end. That's been building since the world was fit to be destroyed, it's been building for 2,000 years. And so, it, one day it will burst up, upon, the, upon the scene. Now I'm going to take you over to Isaiah 13. And we need to learn some things, not just about the ungodliness of this world, but about the works of darkness. And, and this is part of what we needed to know from earlier on in our Bible that causes us that when we read Romans 13, 12, there's a, a whole set of information that comes into our head that we go, oh, and we realize something. And, and so let's, let's start doing that. So Romans 13, 6. How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Well, it's pretty obvious from this that the subject matter is the day of the Lord, and we know that's that day of the Lord's wrath that we've got uh, situated on, the, on our timeline right there. Now what we're going to see is the effects of the Lord's day of wrath upon both the world and the apostate element of Israel. And so we're going to be reading in this passage, taking up there, because both of those groups, both both Israel and the world have outraged God's justice at this point. So, verse 7. Therefore, and by the way, that therefore is pointing you back to, to the day of the Lord. So here are the things that are going to happen as a result of that. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. What do you take that to mean? When, a, when it says a man's heart melted within him. Okay, they're going to be facing the reality of, of, of the Lord's wrath. Uh, what, what would cause a person's heart to melt? 
Fear. Fear. What, 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 that, te now, take a look at what it's going to say. Therefore, all hands shall be faint, every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. I think that's the reality of, of the situation that we were just talking about. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. This is Mother's Day. Every mom ought to be able to think back <laughs> if you've had those kids. Uh, all right. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Now, this is a pretty dreadful description that's being given of what's going to be happening at the day of the Lord. Now, I want to call your attention to the fact that in Isaiah 13, this is instruction that the believing remnant of Israel who find themselves out here in the day of wrath, or if you're looking at this timeline up here, those, the believing remnant of Israel, <clears throat> they're going to be able to read Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, <clears throat> and let's just go ahead and put that on here. And put that on your timeline right there. Isaiah 13 is going to refer them back to the redevelopment of the world of the ungodly. In other words, I... <clears throat> Isaiah is going to be, when, what he writes, those, those believing remnant of Israel out here are going to be able to read Isaiah 13 and see that what's, by the time Isaiah writes, what Satan was producing in the world is the exact same thing that had been taking place in the old world. That it was happening again. And that's all the way back to the time of Isaiah. And so he's going to give them some instruction about that. And so, let's pick it up in verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Now, the words that I bolded for you here are wrath and and fierce anger. And those words ought to conjure up the extremeness of God's justice being outraged with the world of the ungodly. I also want you to notice there's two things here. To lay the land desolate, that's the first one, and destroy the sinners out of it. That's the second part there. And <clears throat> so something, folks... What, what is happening here? Isaiah is saying, by the way, you do know where Isaiah is in the process of all of this. You remember, Isaiah is going to prophesy, and what's going to happen is the northern kingdom is going to be carried away captive by the Assyrians. After that, later, the southern kingdom is going to be carried away captive by the Babylonians, and at that time, Israel will have entered that fifth course of punishment. Where th I'm sorry. Why do I do that? You know the five courses of punishment started out with the milder, and it got more severe and more severe. Here, here's what's happened. By the time it gets to this, this fifth course of punishment, where they're carried away captive out of the land, God is so furious with their ungodliness that He is going to expel them out of the land. And Isaiah is already writing about this when he says, with wrath and fierce anger... He will lay the land desolate and destroy the sinners thereof out of it. And so it's, it's this provoking of God's justice and the outrage at the evil and the ungodliness of the world that this day of the Lord is actually pointing to. Now we'll keep reading verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. 
The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will, now remember, this is the day of the Lord. Remember, he's writing to the believing remnant. <clears throat> Look, I should have said this a while ago. I thought maybe if I said what I said, you'd get it. You remember what I told you Paul is doing in Romans 13, 12? He is reminding us of us by that phrase, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. He is reminding us of something that is supposed to provoke an understanding of how God views the world at large so that that attitude can be adopted in us. The, the, the same thing is going to happen with the believing remnant out here. They're being shown some things so that they understand that what's happening around them, they can start looking at the world at large the same way their father looks at the world at large. It's a, the same thing is happening with them. And so when he says here, <clears throat> verse 11, And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Now God is going to punish two things. Does anybody see what they are? The world and the wicked. And, <clears throat> you're going to, and he's going to punish the world. This is important. He's going to punish the world. Why? He's going to punish the world for their evil, and he's going to punish the wicked for what? Their iniquity. Now, is it the world of the ungodly? I heard someone say ungodly. It is the world of the ungodly. It's becoming the world of the ungodly. But why use these words? Because have we seen the word ungodly used yet? Are you kidding? All the way back to Genesis, God brought in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. All the way to Jude, the ungodly sinners who have ungodly committed all their ungodly deeds and all of that. Here's what's happening. When you see the, when you see the world for its evil, what do you think of? The, the entirety of it, right? Now, I'm going I'm to ask you about it. I'm just going to tell you about it. When he talks about, I'm going to punish the world for their evil. In the old days, in the old days, I would have read this and I would have thought, God is just repeating it in a different way for emphasis. That he was going, he'll punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. But the word and won't let you do that. The word and is giving you an additional element. This is not a repetition. If it was, you wouldn't have the word and in there. What is happening here is, first of all, and by the way, is he going to punish the world for their evil? Yes, he is. But he is also going to punish the wicked for their iniquity. And the world, um, what did we call this? This is the... I'm trying to think of a way, uh, I wasn't even happy with the way I said it in the notes. The big, the big group is the world, the world of the ungodly. They, they are going to be punished. But there's a smaller group, and he calls them the wicked. The teachers, the preachers, the the you, you know what, the wicked, the wicked are the ones who purposefully sign up to be the promoters of ungodliness in the world. They are the, the movers and shakers behind Satan's policy of evil. They're, they're the ones that are actually going to go out and convince the rest of the world to get on board with the policies of, uh, of evil that Satan puts forth. The course of this world that Satan charted, they're the ones that are pushing that. And they're the ones that are selling it to everybody else. Now, there's a bunch of people in the world that are ungodly and committing evil. But there are those who are really the ones that are driving that. They're Satan's right hands to get this thing going and to keep it going. 
That's that group right there. And I want to show you something about this. Look with me. I want to show you that Paul calls it when he says, punish the world for their evil. Look what Paul says in Galatians. Oh, I gave you this Oxford English Dictionary definition first. Evil, the antithesis of good in all its principal senses. I may come back to that, but I want to get to this verse. Galatians 1.4 Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Now this world is evil. Paul talks about it that way all the way back there. Look back in the pre-flood world and look what he says in Genesis 6.5. That the imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only what continually? Evil continually. Now we understand the gravity of something being evil. <clears throat> and so the, the pre-flood world promoted that. It, and, it, 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 and by the way, it didn't just promote ungodliness. It preferred ungodliness. It wanted ungodliness. And, and, and I was talking about this at the break. That these wicked are the ones that are moving the world, not just to be ungodly, but to be Satanly. To actually take on the characteristics of the adversary. And, and these wicked ones, the, the, these these wicked, and we're going to talk about this word iniquity because that's instructive for us. But here, here's what they're doing. They, in the pre-flood world, and they're, they're doing it again in the development of the world of the ungodly, and Isaiah is, is, going to, is talking about it. The world is opening its arms to the adversary and welcoming his policies of, of, of evil that are promoting ungodliness, unrighteousness, and unholiness. They're welcoming that to the repudiation of everything God is doing. They're making an open choice. We don't want God we do want ungodliness. We don't, and, and now let me start to show you some of these verses. Because this is part, and this is going to be instructive for the remnant out in the day of wrath. But we can look at it and see that this is exactly where Satan is moving the world. Job 21. And I really wish I had time to give you some background on the book of Job. And why it's so instructive and the things that are written there. But he, he is talking about the attitude uh, of those times when the world was welcoming to the adversary and his policies of evil. Job 21, Therefore they say unto God, Now understand, this is what men are saying to God. Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Now i got to tell you, I look at that and I think, Whoa! You're going to say that to God? Now that's back there. Think about a man living in the dispensation of grace where God is being long-suffering. And he thinks he's going to say whatever he wants to say and he got away with it. But this is not just the testimony of what they thought back here. It is the testimony of what Satan is producing as he once again brings the world to the brink. So that men will say, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. And then look at this next part. If that wasn't enough, what is the Almighty that we should serve Him? Do you see how this goes hand in hand with denying the Lord that bought them? What's in it for me? That is it. What's in it for me? Who does God think He is to tell me? See, what is the Almighty that we should serve Him? Here's the next part. And what profit should we have if we pray unto Him? What am I going to gain? This is, this is dangerous ground. Why? Because they are treasuring up wrath 
against the day of wrath, under themselves against the day of wrath. That didn't happen just then. I know people that do that now. Uh, people are doing that now. And here's what's happen here's what's going to happen. Oh, you're, the light is coming on here. I can see it in this group. It's not only happening now, but it's going to spread. And there's going to come a day when saying the words I'm just saying will not be allowed. This will get your church closed down one day in the future. That, that, saying these kinds of things. That, but you know what? God is looking at this and he's, His justice is outraged. This is what the world is becoming. It's not just there's, there's that in it. You, that's why I said to you earlier, that wasn't just a description of men are sinners by nature and they're doing some sinful things. They've revved the engine up, so to speak, and they're running ungodliness at full throttle and, and they want it. They desire it. And they, they revel in it. And they boast of it. And they're proud of it. And, they, and they're not making any bones about it. They don't want God. And this is where it's going. This really is where it's going. And your father is giving you this kind of information early on. So when Paul makes a statement like he does in Romans 13, 12, this is all coming back into your thinking and you're going, I understand why God is looking at this world the way that he does. I understand why when he returns at his second advent, the world at large is going to oppose him. So, as, as, as Satan is working all of this, you know, th what they're doing is, they're, they're, they're just expressing how much they hate God. And they're going to reach a point in which God is going to consider the world to be wholly evil. Now let me ask you a question. If it was like that in the pre-flood world, was there a group that did not agree with the rest of the world? There was a small group. There was eight of them on the boat. Here's the thing. By the way, if you want to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, do you remember the, the deal that keeps me? If there's this many righteous, will you spare the city? If there's this many, will you spare the city? If there's this many, will you spare? And the number keeps going down. Let's see if we can get down to a number we can, you know, spare the city. If you were to ask me the question and go, and I don't think we can anything, extrapolate anything from that. I don't. If, there, if you can, I, do, I don't know how to do it. I, I'll, t I'll tell you that. But you may say, okay, eight people in the old world, not very many in Sodom and Gomorrah. How many, how many people will need to be faithfully living in the dispensation of grace before God considers the world at large to be wholly evil? See, it doesn't mean every single person has to be evil. This group could be faithful to the end, and yet God could consider the world at large to be wholly evil. And then you know what he would say? Time for you to come out. I'm going to finish up the night, and then I'm going to bring my day on the scene. So just because we're doing it, and I know there's a lot of things you think about here, and they're not the subject of the, of the message here, but you, 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 you sort of say to yourself, wow, so the more, the more people we get involved in this, the more we're prolonging the dispensation of grace, in a sense. You, you, you see what I'm saying? And almost, but, but you know what? The longer it goes, the more ungodly the world becomes. It's almost like a... Do I do or do I don't thing? Catch yeah, a catch-22. Well, I think the further along we go, the more crazy they think we are. Yeah. Well, the more crazy they will think we are. And, and, and as we were talking about at the break, the things that have been done against, we'll just call it Christian liberties in this country, 
to limit them to this point, you haven't seen the end of that yet. There is going to come a day when you're going to, it, you will either preach the scripted message or you'll be shut down. That day is that day. If it goes long enough. Now, do I believe it has to get there before the world is, is evil? No, I don't. No, I think the world is evil. Well, the Houston mayor tried it with her preachers. Well, they're trying to get them into a non-profit organization so the preachers can say whatever they want to from the book and also. You know, here, here's the thing. All those things that you're talking about, and I know the folks on the tape didn't hear all of that, but when you're talking about trying to script what churches can and can't do and trying to uh, utilize the way churches are formed to, to control what goes on. Let me just tell you, all those are are the natural, although I don't think everybody that does that knows what they're doing, but those are the, that's the natural place that the world of the ungodly goes. And that's never going to go away. You do understand this is never going to reverse itself and we're going to, you know, bring in the kingdom because we just turned the world into being such a righteous place. That is not going to be the way it happens. A friend of mine was talking to me the other day and he says, people say, we're like a barrel on the edge of Niagara Falls. It's about to go over the edge. He said, are you kidding? We gone over the edge and the barrel's broken apart. He said, we're kidding ourselves to think that we're going to somehow keep the barrel from going over the edge. We've gone over the edge. Well, you can debate that all you want to, but here's what I know. If the Bible is true, and I do believe that it is, I see where this is headed. The world is going to become more and more ungodly. And if you thought that Satan would use the ungodliness of the world to swallow up Israel... Guess what he would do in the dispensation of grace with sons and daughters who are being educated? He is going to use the world of the ungodly to swallow them up. Because i got to tell you, he's not worried about the rest of it. He's not impacted by the rest of it. You know, that's amazing, isn't it? When I was a young preacher, boy, you could have never explained this to me unless I knew some things. But if you'd have said, a guy had a worldwide TV ministry and he was reaching millions and say he's not worried about that one whit, I would have thought, how can that be? How can that be? But then you realize there is none of that that is actually producing an impact in his realm. He's, they're happy with it. And he's happy with it. Win-win. But you let a little group... And by the way, I'm not just saying that this may be. This is where we're headed. You let a little group put on the armor of light. And you're going to find out what getting somebody's attention is all about. Because this is the road we're headed down. Now that ought to sober us in our thinking, but it shouldn't scare us out of our shoes. Because we're going to be equipped for this. It's one thing to say, I want to be more than a conqueror. But to do that, you've got to be in the battle, right? And that's the thing about that. But you know what? What an honor to go down this road. I mean, this is going to be something. Okay, well, let me, let me kind of get us back on track here. So, we, what, what Paul is doing is he is now trying to take us and produce the godly thinking in us so that we look at what Satan is producing in this world the way our Father does, and we look at the ungodliness of the world and what's going on around us in our everyday lives as part of what's moving this world toward becoming more and more ungodly. And just because... We have some, some places where uh, evil is not flaunted doesn't mean that the world isn't there or that it's not going to encroach on those places. Um, so here's, what, here's, so here's where, where we're working toward. I'm going to take you back to over there to Isaiah in just a moment. But I, when you get over to, to Romans 13, for instance, and, and you encounter that little term, cast off the works of darkness. 
I'm going to define that for you, but I don't want to just tell you what it is. I'm going to have to take you back and show you some terminology that we would have already seen in our Bible that will allow us to properly define and identify all of those terms over there, like the works of darkness, and understand what they are. So when we read them with Paul, we shouldn't be acting like we're reading that for the first time and guessing at what it is. There really is something back there that will clue us in about all of that. And so that, that's really what we're doing, is we're laying the groundwork so that you see these things the way they were meant to be seen. Because really, if we knew all those things prior in our Bible, then when we'd have gotten over here, it would have been a whole lot easier. We'd have already had these things working in us. And, and by the way, <clears throat> some of this should already be working in you. For instance, when we talk about when you first read God with much long suffering endured the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, I don't know what you thought when you first read that, but when you read that now, you, there ought to be the automatic thought that comes to your mind that God had already reached a point where He was willing to show His wrath, but He is now enduring people who are worthy to be destroyed for ungodliness. He is enduring that with much long suffering. All of that ought to be in your thinking now. So now when you see that verse, we've done enough work on that that you go, oh, that, that has a more full meaning to me right now. The same thing is true about these other terms like the works of darkness and things like that. And so we understand that when, when Satan started out, he had this master plan that would allow him to be possessor of heaven and earth. He developed some particular policies that would actually work toward the achievement of that plan. And the world of men decided to align themselves with Satan in what he was doing. Now, I know we've kind of gotten off track a little bit from the wicked because that's what Isaiah was talking about. I'm not only going to destroy the, wick, the world for its evil, but there's a particular set of men that I'm going to destroy for their iniquity. And I told you we'd come back to that term iniquity, and, and I want to talk about that. Um, in fact, let me just look and see. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Mm, yeah, okay, we're about, we're, we're about to get there. So let me, let me just do this. Because when I talk about these guys being the movers and the shakers behind that, I actually am giving you an illustration. And it's probably not the best one, but I, it worked good for me. Do you remember in the movies of the old days when they have trains? you got a train full of people and it's all moving down the track. But you got some guys up in the engine room and they've got shovels and they're pouring the coal to the engine. And the more they pour the coal to it, the greater power this engine has to move the whole train down the track. Now because this is Satan's train, everybody on the train is ungodly. Evil. It's the world. Yeah, that's the big group. That's the world uh, uh, for their, uh, uh, of evil. But you've got guys in the engine compartment that are shoveling that coal and stoking that engine and building that fire and, and, they're, and that train is picking up speed and it's increasing in power and, it's what, and everybody is being moved along by what these men are doing. That's how I think of these wicked. <coughs> they're the ones that are fueling. They're, they're at the, if, if I could say it this way, they're at the core or they're at the, the center of it all, and they're fueling the whole thing. And there are people <coughs> that get caught up in that. And don't think that the flesh of a man doesn't love to get caught up in ungodliness. I mean, you know it does. But my point is, they're, they're not the ones that are actually selling it to everybody. They just bought in. Now, that doesn't excuse them. God is going to punish the world for its evil. But He is going to punish the wicked for their iniquity. And that iniquity has specific reference to what they're doing here 
to, to, uh, uh, to further and increase and promote uh, Satan's agenda in the world. And uh, <coughs> Psalm 2. I have to finish this, and we can do this pretty quickly, I think. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? You saw this verse earlier, so I just need to point out this one thing. The kings of the earth, there's one group, this is the, this is the, the world, and the rulers, there's Israel, take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. And when I said that back here, they had joined themselves together against God and against Christ, we saw that back in, in Psalm 2. And when they, when they all lined up with the adversary, the world of the ungodly became an adversarial world. It became a Satanly world. <clears throat> and all of that happened back at the time of the cross all the way to when Stephen sees the Lord standing. Uh, back to Isaiah 13. I need to do this so we can finish this up. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I wanted to talk about the issue of iniquity here because, uh, and this is where I gave you that illustration and I don't need to go back over that illustration, but the, the, these, these men are Satan's tools. Remember a while ago when we talked about kind of taking the stick and poking Satan with the Lord's table? These are the men that Satan uses to kind of poke God and goad him. And you know what that is? That is, that is an attempt to goad God into doing something. And this is the provoking of the Lord's justice. Now, these men are the very pinnacle of what God considers to be abominable. And, uh, and, so, and, and so I want to talk about this word, these words, wicked. We find this word again in Paul's epistles in 2 Thessalonians when he talks about when the day of wrath comes on the scene, there is a particular man that Satan is going to utilize to carry out his agenda over in the land of Israel and the surrounding nations. And that guy we call the Antichrist because that's what the Bible calls him. Take a look at what Thessalonians calls him. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that, notice that is a capital W, wicked, which is a personification of wickedness. In other words, there is a man who is the very embodiment of wickedness, and that's why the capital W, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. When he talks about that wicked antichrist, when we see in Isaiah 13, he's going to destroy the wicked for their iniquity, the same men that would have promoted the ungodliness of the world in time past are the same kind of men who will join with the Antichrist for the extermination of his people Israel and to make the world into the world of ungodliness. And they're the very men who will oppose Christ at his advent that do not want him to return, that do not want his righteousness and do not want his kingdom. And they're going to stand with Satan in that. And they're willing. They are willing participants. Look, there's a lot of people on the train that <clears throat> maybe, maybe they just don't realize what's going on. They just love doing whatever they do. But there are other people who know exactly what they're doing on that train. But these wicked, they do know. And there's no one there that's accidentally doing what it is that they're doing. So when we talk about iniquity... <clears throat> We're talking about the way God views, and I'm going to paint the picture this way. When you talk about sin or ungodliness or unrighteousness, when you talk about an act being a sinful act or an unrighteous act or an ungodly act, when you talk about that, when God calls that iniquity, He is talking about the 
abominableness of how he views that particular act that causes his outrage to boil up in him to the point to where what he wants to do is immediately stamp it out and exterminate it. That it, it is that bad to him. And when he uses this word iniquity, he is saying the things that they are doing, they're not just sinners you know, committing a sin, but they're actually involved in the escalation of sin to bring it to a point of such... Uh, of, of, of such uh, utter ungodliness. I can't even think of the term I'm trying to think of. But they're bringing it to such a, a pinnacle of ungodliness and rebellion against God. And they're, they're so aligned with what Satan is doing that when God sees iniquity, his instant reaction is to want to annihilate it on the spot. But in this dispensation of grace, guess what? With much long suffering, he's enduring this. But it doesn't mean that's not how he feels about it. So these are getting the same descriptive term that is given to the man of sin in the tribulation. And what they are doing isn't just sinful or unrighteous. What they're doing, God considers it to be iniquity. And if it were not for the more important thing that God is doing, His fury with the, un with, with the point at which the ungodliness of the world has come to, if, if it had not been for this, you could have shoved this right over and the world would have already gone through that great and terrible day of the Lord's wrath. <clears throat> and here's what he's after. Does he have us in mind? He absolutely does. Does he want to, does he want to deliver the creature? He absolutely wants to deliver. Because if you don't deliver the creature from the bondage of corruption, that creature is useless. And just like He has chosen Israel to repossess the world, He has chosen the body of Christ to repossess the heavenly places. But here's the other part of this. Satan's plan of evil. And this is why I talked to you about things I talked to you all the way back here. When we talked about the flood, that, that the, the flood affected not only things on the earth, but it affected things where? In the heavens. Because what Satan did through his rebellion did not just affect the earth. It affected the created heavens as well. <clears throat> and at the end, when God totally... You understand that here's what God has to do. He is not only going to finally throw Satan into the lake of fire, but he must also totally stamp out his plan of evil. And the plan of evil does not just concern this earth. It also concerns the heavenly places. And by the way, if you're going to talk about the concentration of where Satan and his angelic followers are, I mean, you're talking about controlling the heavenly places. So what God says is, yes, I want to have my day of wrath. Yes, they've driven me to a limit. Yes, I don't want to look at that anymore. But I have something more important that I'm going to do. I am going to make a provision for the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ will include delivering the creature from the bondage of corruption, but it also includes the destruction of the satanic plan of evil in the heavenly places. And that has not been provided for by anything in Israel's program. And God says, if I'm going to get it all back, 
Now, are you starting to see a little bit of what we're putting in the face of Satan by God interrupting the night at the point that he did? Satan, you know what, it, you know, it really and truly, if God would have just destroyed it all and brought in his kingdom and done all of that, he could have lived with that. You know why? He'd have had control of the body of the creature for eternity. But God says, I got something else I'm going to do. I am going to provide for the destruction of Satan's plan of evil in the heavenly places. And that is part of what we're bringing to the eyes of the adversary by understanding how God views this present world, why he is being why he is enduring with much long suffering those vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, understanding our part as his sons and daughters, and knowing that when this is over, not only will that provision have been made, but God will bring about his day of wrath on this earth and destroy the plan of evil here as well. Well, you know what, and you, you know, I, I got, you know, and I don't mean to give God totally human uh, frailties, but you understand, He has already reached the point to say, I need to do something about this, and only because I've got this other thing that must be done, am I holding off. So, is there anything resting on us? Is there anything invested in us? Are you kidding? No wonder Paul starts this section out saying, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Hey folks, the clock is ticking. we got to get with the program. Yeah, it's high time. We've got to get this. And now you're going to enter into a whole new operation of your father. And to do that, the godly thinking, what we've begun to establish here is the godly thinking is, this is, this is how God's viewing it. Look, I could I spend a much longer on this, but let, let me just say it like this. Before, when I used to view those five courses of punishment, and I knew that the last part of the fifth course of punishment was going to be to bring about the Lord's day of wrath, and, and then for Him to return and put down His enemies and establish the kingdom. What I did not have a full appreciation of was the fact that God, God, God wasn't just looking at stuff to do to punish people, but He was looking at what must be done in order for His plan and purpose to be achieved. It wasn't God just being angry about sin, but that the world had come to a place where, um, to use that other illustration, we're not going to push the barrel back up over the falls. It had already come to the place where God says, now I have to deal with this. This is what has to be done. Now God pushed all this back once at the flood. Reset, hit the reset button, and here we go again. It was ready to go again at Stephen. God's now enduring with much long suffering. It'll be ready to go again when the night is over and the day and the day comes. And I hate to say it, but there's one more at the end of the millennium. A final mop up of those who are going to go into the kingdom and maybe even be born in the kingdom who will not have a heart for God or his kingdom of righteousness. And they will only obey because he rules with a rod of iron. And God will purge all of that rebellious element out at the end of the millennial kingdom. Now that's really a separate subject. So when we come back next time, I still haven't done one of the things I told you that we needed to do. And it's not in your notes. I knew we wouldn't get to this today. But how do we find this understanding of the terminology of the things like the works of darkness. <clears throat> what is it sitting back there in Isaiah and other places? We're only going to look at a, at a few of them. What is it? There's really a bunch of them. But 
in the few places that we have left to look at, what is it that we were supposed to know about that, that when Paul writes about casting off the works of darkness, it makes us realize this is what he's talking about, and this is what is at stake. So I, want us to, I don't want us to just understand it because I told you that's what it was. I want us to get this firmly. I want us to be fully persuaded of the truth of it because we can see this in the Scriptures. So we still have some things to do on this first phrase before we move to the next part because it's part of the godly thinking. And that one phrase, the night is far spent, the day is hand, ought to speak volumes to us and, and cause us to understand. All right, let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. And uh, Lord, we realize we are living in the time of the long-suffering of God. Calls us to be long-suffering. We're suffering with Christ through many things during this time. And Lord, we pray to do so to your glory and to the effectual working of your word in us. We really want to understand about these things. There's a lot to see here, a lot. And um, we look forward to getting a full appreciation of the doctrine, for the thinking to get established in us, the living to get established in us, and then for us to labor in making an impact on Satan's realm. And we look